Happy Monday, everybody. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. Today's case is a little bit longer than usual, so let's get right into it. This is one that I like to call Rob McElrath's Way. Susanville is a small town located in Lassen County near the northern tip of California. Approximately 17,000 people live in the eight square mile former logging and mining town, which now has a much different economy. Two state prisons are there, and a federal correctional institute is also nearby. Almost half of the adults living in Susanville work at one of the three prisons, where more than 6,000 people are incarcerated. That means about a third of the population living in Susanville are doing it behind bars. Of course, Susanville also has its own police department, and when an upstanding officer named Rob McElrath went missing, the community sprung into action to find the truth, a truth that would be hard for many to believe. Joanna Beckett was described as a tomboy who loved to fish and camp as a child that later developed into a, quote, girly girl as she entered high school. She even entered pageants, at one time being crowned Miss Lassen County. But teachers recall her as being a bit shy and a little bit of a quiet wallflower. She played flute in high school, and that's where she met a young, handsome lead saxophone player named Rob McElrath. Rob was a year ahead of Joanna and a friend of a boyfriend of hers, so he didn't pursue anything, but friends believe he did have some feelings for her. After Rob graduated, he went into the Marine Corps. Joanna graduated and went to college. However, she quit when she got pregnant with a baby girl. She got married and focused on becoming a homemaker. Another daughter came along, but the marriage would end after only a few years. After serving his country, Rob returned to Susanville and now served his local community by working in law enforcement. Like many of the residents of Susanville, he started off with a job at one of the local jails. He began his law enforcement career as a correctional officer. Then he entered the police academy and worked as a deputy sheriff before finally becoming a police officer for the city of Susanville. At a local mini-mart, he ran into a familiar face. Joanna worked there and was also working on her second marriage. One day, her husband got violent and Joanna called law enforcement. Rob, who was working as a deputy sheriff at the time, was the one to respond to the scene and he arrested her second husband. Soon after that, Joanna filed for divorce and Rob and Joanna began dating. Within months, they were married. Rob even adopted Joanna's two daughters. Rob and Joanna would also go on to have two more children of their own, another girl and a boy. In 2008, Rob McElrath was named Officer of the Year. He was known for being a very caring, approachable, and compassionate officer that some called a gentle giant. Joanna worked as a waitress to help the family make ends meet. January 2nd, 2011, Rob's partner, Alan Edman, and his wife, Tammy, received a strange text message from Joanna asking if Alan was working that day. When Tammy replied that Alan was off that day, which would mean Rob was off as well, Joanna replied that Rob was missing. Also missing was his service revolver. However, his badge was left at home. Alan was immediately concerned because Rob would always carry his gun and badge, even when off duty. Alan called the police station and they jumped in the car to head over to the McElrath home. However, before they got there, a call came in across the police scanner. A body had been found at a spot called Devil's Corral below a bridge. Alan called into his sergeant and learned that Rob's car was also found at Devil's Corral. Alan and Tammy arrived at the McElrath home to find Joanna crying on the couch. More family members arrived and eventually so did the local pastor. The family knew that if he was showing up, he wasn't bringing good news. Investigators at the scene had confirmed it was the body of Rob McElrath. This was something that shocked our entire community. It put us to our knees, said Gary Bridges, a friend of Rob's. Joanna was taken down to the station so investigators could assemble a timeline. 
She told them that since Rob had to work New Year's Eve, they celebrated a day later and that Rob had a lot to drink. She said he was having hallucinations from his days in the Marine Corps and crying about friends he had lost. Eventually, he got mad at her and left with his gun wearing pajama pants. As the scene was being processed, the initial assumption was that he might have jumped from the bridge above. But if he did, why was there blood up on the bridge railing as well? Crime scene investigators were also curious why sections of the snow looked like it had been raked by a person's hand, and when they dug under that raked snow, they found more of Rob's blood. The autopsy showed that Rob was likely dead before his fall off the bridge and to the canyon floor. How did they know this? His death was caused by a gunshot wound, not a fall. The local authorities called in the Department of Justice and FBI to assist in the investigation. As the investigation continued, the community rallied around the McElrath family, bringing them meals and helping them as they grieved. Investigators kept digging and learned that the relationship between Rob and Joanna was not the fairy tale it originally seemed. Joanna had relationships with other men during their marriage, and Rob found out about more than one of her infidelities. Despite this, Rob kept working on the relationship and tried to keep their family together. Investigators now had a whole different pool of people to investigate further, including one of Joanna's more recent flames, a man named Robin James. Robin was the exact opposite of Rob. While Rob worked in the local jails, Robin served time in them. One of his sentences was for spousal abuse in 2008. Robin worked as a cook at a restaurant that Joanna worked at as a waitress. Rob found out about their relationship through text messages the two exchanged. He temporarily moved out of the home, and Rob and James moved in with Joanna and the four kids. Rob didn't give up, and a few months before his death, Joanna asked Rob and James to move out. Rob moved back in, and the family was together for Thanksgiving. Investigators now wanted to speak to Rob and James. They took him into custody on January 6th and began interviewing him. I don't think anyone expected that he would admit to shooting Rob at Devil's Corral, but that's exactly what happened. According to Rob and James, Joanna and Rob arrived at the bridge together. James had planned on pushing Rob off the bridge, but he fought back. Rob and James was no match for Rob McElrath, so James then shot him and threw him into the canyon. Rob and James was charged with first-degree murder, and investigators brought Joanna in for additional questioning. She admitted that she was on the bridge and that she saw James shoot Rob, but she also stated that Rob and James went over to the McAlrath home earlier that night. Words were exchanged, but the confrontation de-escalated. James left, and Rob and Joanna continued their celebration. She said that Rob and Joanna went to Devil's Corral to see the stars and that it was a special place to them. She didn't know that Rob and James followed them there. She told investigators that James shoved her aside and attacked Rob, shooting him and pushing him off the bridge. Joanna says she then panicked, not wanting to lose both her husband and lover in the same night, so on the way home, she came up with the story that Rob was missing. Investigators got a warrant to check the text messages between Joanna and Rob and James and found out that Joanna wasn't as innocent as she led investigators to believe. She conspired with and pressured Rob and James into the act of killing Rob. She also discussed details of drugging Rob by putting prescription narcotics in the mudslides that she was making for him that night and then arranging for Rob and James to come there to finish the job. Joanna was arrested for murder. Her trial began May 23, 2014, and the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. They believed that she did drug Rob with prescription narcotics, and together, Rob and James and Joanna then took him to the bridge. Right before the trial began, Joanna's legal team met with the prosecutors and struck up a plea deal. She pled guilty and received a life sentence with a chance at parole after 25 years. Rob and James agreed to the same deal. They will be eligible for parole in 2036. Samantha McElrath, Joanna's daughter that Rob adopted, said in court, I lost both my dad and my mom. Thanks to my mom, I'll never have a normal day in my life. Joanna stated in court, 
I know that Robert loves me still, which prompted several people to leave the courtroom. In 2016, the city honored Rob by naming their newest street Rob's Way, which has a memorial bench in his honor. At the dedication ceremony, Pastor Engel gave an impassioned speech. It is a straight street, which reflects Rob's integrity and strength. It is a short street to bring to mind that his life was cut short. It connects Main Street and the courthouse, which reminds us of his compassion for the community he served and his commitment to the law he upheld. At the end of the road is our American flag, which reflects Rob's patriotism to a country that he loved and served. It is a street that is appropriately named to continuously remind us of Rob's way. Case cracked. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to a show I had not seen before, but when I was researching this episode, I saw that a television show called Snapped did an episode on it. Uh, so I included that as part of my research on this. Um, just a really troubling story. Uh, it just bothers me that we have someone that goes beyond just being an upstanding citizen, someone that makes it their life to take care of other people, does it so well that literally the community like knew and loved this guy. Uh, one of the things that comes up in Snapped is uh, one of his friends says that even when he was arresting people, uh, he would like kind of apologize to them. Or if he was writing a ticket, he'd be like, oh, I hate doing this, but I, you know, this is my job. I have to write this ticket. Just seemed like a really special, kind man. And even to go through what he did in terms of his relationship, knowing that his wife was seeing other men, um, still trying to work on that relationship over and over, trying to keep that family together for the four children. There's just a lot that I really admire about this guy. And uh, I'm thankful that I got to learn his story by pulling this episode together for all of you. Of course, I've got some pretty different feelings in terms of Joanna and Robin James, um, but I do believe they got what was coming to them, and we'll see if they actually do get paroled when 2036 rolls around. Um, I'm kind of hoping it doesn't go as easy as they might be assuming, but... That's it for this episode, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Before I end today's episode, I do want to give a special shout out to someone that supports me every month through PayPal. They actually set up a recurring payment. You can do the same at lordandarts.com if you want to help support the channel here. Jennifer Wilson, thank you so much for supporting the channel month after month. I truly, truly appreciate it. There's also other stuff you can do there. There's merchandise you can buy. There's a link to Patreon. You can find out about new shows I have coming up, all kinds of stuff over at lordandarts.com. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and I'll see you back here on Wednesday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Mm -hmm.